Miguel uh, de los Santos, 27 years old, suffered gunshot wound, wounds um, at the hands of um, police officers. What happened there? Did the law enforcement officers apply excessive force or disproportionate force in the face of whatever danger they had perceived? He's not in the best mental state. And this is over, what, a period of over 12 hours. He was very scared for his life. If that person in front of them was their brother or their best friend or their son, how, how would they have handled this? I don't know how to describe it. It's, we thought we lost him. Um, it's nice to meet you too. I saw the interview that you did with my family. Thanks for doing that. Um, I'm doing all right right now. Can you t take us through, and I hope it's okay, some of the injuries that you suffered? So when I woke up, I was in a lot of pain. Um, it was about two months of hospital that I was in. So I woke up and I didn't even see everything that I had yet, but my stomach felt like it was really, like being stabbed with sword. I had a tube coming in here and here, and then two tubes coming in here, and they were draining my blood that was up in this area. And then later on, I found out that I had a cut that was from here to here where they did exploratory surgery, where they were looking for fragments of bullets. I had a broken leg, and they had to put a rod, a metal rod, into my leg. One of the bullets hit my spine around here, and it got stuck in the, in the spinal canal where it was um, blocking my nerves that went down to my legs, so I can't even feel my legs right now. And, um, that was two months ago. I had several surgeries, and then about a month later, they decided to take the bullet out so that I could regain some movement, possibly. Do you even know how many bullets landed in your body? Um, right now, I have no idea because I kept asking the doctors at St. Francis how many bullets hit me. And they said, oh, I'm not the one that worked on you. And then another doctor would say, oh, I'm not the one that worked on you. And so I never got the final count of bullets. Cielo, the last time we spoke was two months ago. Um, what has changed since? A lot's changed. Miguel's come home now, so we're really excited about that. Um, we've moved areas, new apartment, just really new lifestyle. We're trying to get back to, to normal. So. Yeah, the last time we spoke, um, we did it, We weren't even sure that he was going to make it. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you find out that he was going to come out and that, you know, there can be some sense of normalcy in your life and how, how did you react? He's, he's a fighter, honestly, and I didn't even realize that they shot him with as many bullets as they did until I was in the um, police station and my mother was the one who actually told me so it was, it was just a very crazy scenario and he was in a, a medically induced coma for about a week um, fighting for his life though finally we hear back from the doctor saying he's expected to to survive and that was just that we weren't able to see him until um, maybe a month or so after because of covid restrictions in the hospital but um He's a fighter. And so there was a time when people around you, when I interviewed your family at the time, they weren't sure that you were going to make it. 
what was your first realization after the pain has subsided? I almost didn't make it. Like, I really should have died that night. Because if they shot me six times, then that means that they were, like, really trying to kill me, you know? So, I, and you hear all the time about people getting shot once and they die. But I got shot six times and I'm pretty happy to be alive, basically. What has this ordeal taught you? It taught me that this is basically my second shot at life. And I've been trying to do as much going out as I could, trying to live my life, basically. I think honestly, just because we are such a young couple, you never expect something like this to happen. So um, what I've taken out of this is really just to, to dream bigger. When you love, love harder, and really appreciate every single moment you have, because you don't know if it's going to be your last. And I do find myself squeezing him a little tighter at night, or just saying I love you a bit more, because um, that connection is special, and it, it would be devastating to have lost that. What have you changed from your life before to your life now? What are you trying to change given that this is your second lease on life? A lot really has changed. Almost everything has changed. It's yeah. a big change to be in a wheelchair right now. Right. It's crazy. Like I never expected this to happen to me. And I'm talking to my friends more. I'm talking to my family a lot more. Life is really short and you blink and it's passed by. It's crazy. How do you hope for this case to be resolved? I just really want justice for what happened and like um, I'm trying to stay positive about it. We are actually on a waiting holding pattern right now. Um, I have not received any discovery from the sheriff's department. I actually have not received any of the uh, medical records that I had requested from St. Francis. So what's important is to get that evidence from the Sheriff's Department so it can be properly assessed. I am giving them some time to provide um, the evidence, but we're not going to wait forever because there are statutes that need to be met. We need the body camera, we need the investigations. I do appreciate the fact that the Sheriff's uh, the Sheriff's Department issued the identities of the people of the two um, sheriffs who were involved in the shooting. Uh, right now, I would just like to keep the focus on him and his um, recovery. That's very important and he derives a lot of um, inspiration from people who reach out to him. Uh, that's his task. On the other hand, there, there's a whole legal process that, that is occurring outside of Miguel. And, and that's my job. You know, let people look at Miguel, see the impact of what the sheriffs did on a human being and his life and all those dreams that have, you know, been shattered and, and the recovery from that. I think, yes, we do need closure and for Miguel especially, but for me on my end, I'm just trying to make sure that he heals properly. What are your plans for the future? For the future, I plan on marrying Cielo, and I'm also planning on going out a lot more. Um, it seems like there's not enough time, not enough hours in a day to do everything I want to do. If you could, could go back to that day that it happened, what would you change knowing what you know now? Um, maybe I would have slept all day. <laughs> your message for the women in your life, we, inter we interview them as you saw, right? Um, we'll start with um, Cielo, your fiancé. She's really strong, she's a very strong person, very um, bubbly and gets along with anybody. Um, and I love you a lot. To my mom, I would say thank you for my life and I'll always be your baby, and I'm sorry that you had to be put through this scare. It's not easy to see your child almost die before you do. 
And your lawyer, Attorney Claire Espina, who's really been fighting for you through this. She's probably the, one of the strongest of us all because she's dealing with all the legal stuff and I, I wouldn't even know where to start with all of that. Really, one of the blocks that we're leaning on right now for help with this and I thank her a lot. It is a story that we need to be aware of um, because it involves Filipino Americans, mental health, people of color, police brutality. I mean, they all converge on this incident of April 23rd. And it is one of the things that we have to keep tabs on. And as a lawyer, that's my intent. I'll be doing that. If you're having anxiety or depression, or if you're way too stressed out, like you deserve to be happy and you can get help. There's a lot of ways to get help. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, or even get a therapist. That's been working for me so far. Get some exercise too. That'll help your mood brighten up. Get some air too, just go outside. It's, it's great.